Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about government policy and human rights. Welcome back to Policy and Rights here at Depictions Media Radio. I'm your host, Michael Cloggs. A couple of quick facts about housing in British Columbia. Under the Homeowner Protection Act, the new homes in the province of British Columbia are required to, regist- to be registered with BC Housing. Uh, the registration must occur prior to the issuance of the building permit or prior to construction commencing in geographical areas where building permits are not required. Uh, the uh, British Columbia government is making a large investment into housing in BC's history, seven billion dollars in ten years, and are working or with partners to deliver one hundred thousand fourteen um, affordable homes in ten years. And since twenty seventeen, the province has funded more than. 38,000 affordable new homes that have been completed or underway for people in British Columbia. Okay, so uh, David E.B. made a, an announcement about um, uh, new supports for the uh, renters of British Columbia and how to help the residents of, of British Columbia just find affordable housing. And we have uh, the recording of that um, press conference and the announcement that he is going to make around that along with um, the ministers and support pe- people who are helping make this happen for the residents of British Columbia. Mr. Chandra Herbert, I'm the member of the legislature for Vancouver's West End and Coal Harbor neighborhoods, and uh, I'm glad to be here. I see my colleague, MLA for this neighborhood, uh, Katrina Chen. Thank you for being here. Of course, the mayor of Burnaby. Welcome, Mr. Mayor. Thanks for having us here. And of course, I want to acknowledge the Tsleil-Waututh, the, Tooth, the Squamish Musqueam nations for having us here uh, on their traditional territories. It's a good day to be here. Uh, I'm here today as the newly announced uh, liaison for renters. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Premier. Glad to keep doing this work. And I'm here today because I'm so excited about what we're going to hear shortly. But I won't give it away just yet um, because I'm here to, to share that, of course, what we all know together is that people need secure, affordable housing. They need it to be able to live their best lives. They need it to be able to give back to their communities to support our province, to grow our economy. That's what we as a provincial government want for everyone in our province, is to have safe, secure, affordable housing. But we know that for too long, this has not been a given for people. For too many, uh, they've had safe, secure housing, and then they've seen it taken away. Uh, Whether or not it's because of greed, whether or not it's because of neglect, uh, there's too many reasons, and that's why we need a provincial government that acts for renters that acts for affordable housing. 
Our government is doing that, banning the fixed-term tenancy loophole, banning the geographic area increase clause, increasing resources for the residential tenancy branch so that they can both step in when there's illegal actions happening to stop them before people lose their housing, and then to penalize those that are harming people through illegal actions. We need secure housing and we need to help in all the ways possible. We also need to build more affordable housing and that's what we're doing with over 36,000 new units on the way or already open in this province. That's record setting pace and I like to say we're only getting started because there's so much more to do. To share some of that so much more to do, uh, I'm excited to introduce a friend from a long time back who's been an advocate, a supporter of renters, a fighter for housing uh, since before he entered politics and I'm so grateful he's our Premier. Please welcome Premier David Eby. Uh, thank you very much, Spencer, and thanks for taking on the role of special uh, liaison on renters, um, a critically important role for our province that renters have a strong voice in our government, and uh, and really glad that you're stepping up to do that. Um, I am uh, really excited to be here at Cardston uh, today, uh, uh, joined uh, by Rep Kalon, Minister for Housing. Uh, you met the special liaison for housing, Spencer Chandra Herbert. Uh, uh, we have the CEO of the Aboriginal Housing Management Association, the Nonprofit Housing Association, the Co-op Housing Federation, and, uh, and in particular I'd like to welcome Gay Monkman who is here. She is the chair of the co-op uh, at uh, 115 Place Housing Co-op, the president, pardon me, and uh, she'll be speaking about uh, her experience here. Uh, this building, the reason why I'm excited to be here is this is one of three buildings uh, in Burnaby where we preserved 425 units of affordable co-op homes for seniors and those with moderate incomes. And it was made possible because of a significant investment from our government, but not just our government. It was also a partnership between BC Housing, the Community Land Trust of BC, and in particular the City of Burnaby. And uh, Mike Hurley is here, the Mayor of the City of Burnaby. And I, I just have to say, you know, uh, we wouldn't have gotten across the line without his leadership and without the leadership of the City of Burnaby on this, uh, on this important purchase. I was talking with Gay before uh, we came out here today about uh, her memory of us talking on the phone uh, when in the depths of despair when this building uh, was uh, looking at uh, when it was up for sale, uh, when it was potentially going to be purchased by a large uh, international real estate, uh, large national real estate investment trust uh, or somebody else uh, and the distress and the strain uh, for the people who lived in this building what does this mean for our rents? What does this mean for our homes, for our community? Vulnerable seniors, and I am so glad that we came to a positive outcome from that conversation. Thank you, Gabe, for your work. Uh, BC, as we know, BC is a wonderful place to live. Uh, we know that's why uh, we're seeing record numbers of people choosing to move to our province, which is wonderful news. But we also know uh, that finding an affordable home is challenging. Uh, the long-lasting effects of the pandemic, our growing population, uh, supply chain issues, labor challenges are all contributing to a very serious housing crisis. And for too long, this housing crisis has worked to the benefit of speculators and investors instead of people looking for a place to live. Uh, increasingly, we're seeing activity across Canada and in British Columbia of large international corporations buying up rental buildings, speculating to uh, earn investment income on homes that people count on affordable rents uh, and uh, in communities where people need to live. Uh, they're called uh, real estate investment trusts. And in too many cases, this predatory model leads to evictions and rent hikes and, uh, and can lead to homelessness. As a result, middle class families, uh, seniors, vulnerable people are facing challenges just living in their own home communities. There is no feeling worse uh, than waking up in the morning and seeing a for sale sign on the front lawn of the building that you live in because it opens up a whole question about whether you're going to be able to stay in your home. Now there are others out there that would invite that speculation back into our housing market who think it's a great idea uh, to have investors uh, uh, acting in this way uh, and putting housing uh, into a precarious uh, uh, position, putting renters into a precarious position in their house. Uh, we disagree. We're cracking down on speculation and we're making investments to protect housing just like we did here at Cardston Court. And we're starting to see real results. Purpose-built rental construction was up 10% last year. That's the highest rate of purpose-built rental construction ever 
uh, since data started being collected by BC Housing, and seven times what it was just a decade ago. But despite this increase, we can't afford to lose affordable rental housing. Uh, we need to keep pace with population growth, and we need to be adding more housing, not losing affordable housing. To make sure that homes are about people and not about investors, we need to do more. That's why today I'm so pleased to announce the creation of a new $500 million renter protection fund. This, this fund is going to preserve affordable housing for renters across BC for many years to come. It will provide one-time capital grants to nonprofit housing organizations to purchase affordable rental buildings and co-ops that are listed for sale. This will protect renters living there now and safeguard that affordable housing for the long term. We expect the fund to protect renters in thousands of affordable units. Preventing people from getting evicted and seeing their former homes redeveloped into out of reach luxury condos or high end housing uh, is one of the key purposes of this fund. This builds on other steps we've taken to deliver the homes we need as part of uh, the first 100 days that I've been in office. We've removed unfair strata restrictions to turn empty condos into homes available for rent. We're working with municipalities to set ambitious targets to deliver more housing. And we're taking urgent action to get people off of the streets and into stable housing. Now, if the pandemic taught us one thing, it's that going it alone doesn't work. We're all in this together. We could not do this work without partners like the City of Burnaby, the nonprofit housing uh, associations, the co-op housing sectors, the indigenous housing sectors. All of us are united in our belief that a home is foundational to building a good life and key to building a stronger BC, one for, where everyone can find a home that they can afford, uh, that is good for them, good for their family, and where nobody gets left behind. Thank you. And now, pleased to hand it over to Minister Kalon for further remarks. Good. Thank you so much, uh, Premier, and good morning, and thanks to everybody here. Um, a lot more people than I thought on a rainy day. It's nice to see all the, the smiley faces for this amazing announcement. I, too, want to acknowledge that we are here today on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nation. Uh, as the Premier has highlighted, for too long, people in BC have struggled to find homes that they can afford and homes that they deserve. After two decades of underinvestment in affordable housing, we are seeing the impacts of the housing crisis on people and in our communities. Many of those people have faced the impossible choice of leaving their community and to find a home that they can afford. That to us is unacceptable. And that is why our government is working tirelessly to make sure that we can that people in our communities can stay where they want to live, uh, stay where they have community connections, uh, and have a home where they feel safe and comfortable. Premier Evie has uh, set out a very ambitious uh, housing plan for our province, and I'm committed to make sure that we're delivering on that plan that's providing and retaining housing for British Columbians so they can build a good life for themselves and for their families. We've already taken some key steps to increase housing in our province with more than 36,000 units that are either built or underway. Housing, just like the building behind us, the, Cards, uh, the Cardston Court Cooperative. Uh, and today, as the Premier announced, we're very excited to build on that important work. This rental protection fund will allow us to continue to preserve affordable uh, rental co-op housing stock and provide good homes for British Columbians. Now, we know the housing needs uh, are, are great, uh, which is why we're expediting the creation of this fund so that this fund can facilitate the first acquisitions, hopefully later this, this year, which I'm really excited about. We also recognize this fund should be in the hands of the people who know the non-market uh, uh, housing industry the best. That's why it'll be managed by this external group of our not-for-profit partners with strong expertise in this sector. The Aboriginal Housing Management Association, the BC Not-for-Profit Housing Association, and the Cooperative Housing Federation of British Columbia. These strong partnerships between the province and the not-for-profits is critical to delivering the affordable homes for people in BC. We're grateful for these amazing organizations for their uh, knowledge, for the work that they've been doing to support affordable housing throughout this province. 
And I know the Premier mentioned we can expect this fund will allow not-for-profits to prevent thousands of units from being lost to redevelopment, meaning fewer people will be displaced from their homes. While this is an exciting new step, we know there's a lot more work to be done. Our government will continue to work every day on more housing options, more affordable housing options for people across this province. And now sh to share more about what this fund means to the not-for-profit community, I'd like to welcome Margaret Foe, who is the CEO of the Aboriginal Housing Management Association, to, to the podium to say a few words. Margaret. All right. Thank you, Minister Kalon. Uh, Premier Eby. Uh, in the language of my Simshan ancestors, I'm saying thank you for having us here. Uh, I'm not sure, Minister Kalon, if everybody's really smiling or if, like me, it's their teeth chattering. Because <laughs> I certainly feel like my teeth are chattering at this particular moment. Uh, but it's an honour for the Aboriginal Housing Management Association of BC, AMA, to be here today with our partners from the provincial government and our partners from the sector, BC MPHA, Jill Atke and CHFBC Tom Armstrong in the rollout of this announcement of the $500 million investment in the Rental Protection Fund. It's a critical step. You know, we all, I, I used to say just as late as last summer, we all just need to look in our own backyards of our communities to see the depth and, and despair of the housing crisis and the impact it is having in our communities. But now I actually say we only need to look into our own families because I don't think there's a single one of us as human beings here in British Columbia or across Canada that haven't been somehow impacted along the spectrum of housing, uh, not only here in British Columbia, but across Canada. And activities and, and investments like this rental protection fund are one part of the key solutions that need to be to be installed in order for us to mitigate that ongoing crisis. And so we are grateful to be here. We're honoured to be here with our partners. Uh, we know that we need to do more. Uh, Minister Callan uh, alluded to some of the 100-day commitments that Premier Eby announced when he was, uh, um, what's the language, when you were sworn in? <laughs> I was going to say installed, but that didn't sound right. When you were sworn in, uh, you know, a very ambitious plan, but something that is absolutely essential for, for us to affect change in our community. And to that end, our organization, the Aboriginal Housing Management Association, almost a year ago today on January 26, 2022, released the first ever provincial urban rural and northern Indigenous housing strategy that is truly a for Indigenous, by Indigenous strategy that was led by the voices of our people. It's a very comprehensive and evidence-based strategy that I encourage everyone to take a look at. You can find it on our website. Um, but we created that strategy because the, the solutions need to be driven by community. And the fact that our Premier and our Minister recognized that when it came to the Rental Protection Fund by putting their faith and their trust in sector leaders like BCMPHA, CHFBC and AMA is a huge example for the rest of this country, in fact for the rest of the world to take notice of. And I share that framework with you because we as Indigenous leaders are frequently asked across this country why it seems that BC is always a leader in housing innovation. Why is BC and Indigenous BC in particular always coming to the forefront with solutions for community that are driven by community? In fact, we get asked on an international scale from our colleagues in Australia and New Zealand on the innovation and creation of not only our organization, but the level of investment that this government has been putting to ground for the last couple of decades into housing which other provinces aren't seeing in fact other countries aren't seeing the kind of leadership that is demonstrated here in British Columbia and my answer is two things one tenacity we don't give up no is not an option and I know my colleagues in government know this because they get hounded by me every day for the last 25 years to constantly make change and to make investments but the second and most important one is partnerships. And that's the partnerships not only amongst the sector, having sector leaders like Jill Atke at BCMPHA and Tom Armstrong at CHFBC, not only be allies to the housing crisis for all, but to recognize that Indigenous people in the current housing crisis have been 
even more impacted by the negative uh, impacts that we're seeing across the spectrum of housing. And both of our sector leaders have volunteered to put that issue first and foremost on their platforms within the not-for-profit and the co-op housing sector. And so I want to acknowledge that, that true allyship is about understanding where the most critical needs are. And I raise my hands to my, my, my colleagues for the work that they've done. The last and pro probably the most important piece is the need for government to step up and all levels of government to step up. Municipal leaders, provincial leaders and federal leaders not only stepping up as we heard earlier but stepping in and understanding what the crisis really is and where the strength and power of solutions can come from. And, and, and again I'm just going to reiterate for the 25 plus years that the Aboriginal Housing Management Association has been on the ground we could not be where we are today without this government constantly supporting us, constantly being behind us and more importantly investing in the work that we're doing here. And so I just want to say thank you to our provincial partners and allies for all of the great work that they do. And we look forward as sector leaders to supporting our community through this new rental protection fund. So with that, I'll say to Aksim, thank you everyone for being here. And I'll turn this over to Jill Atke from BCMPHA. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Margaret. I uh, so it might be really miserable outside, um, uh, but it's actually a beautiful day uh, to be standing alongside our partners uh, at AMA, CHFBC, and the province of British Columbia. So I want to start out uh, with a number, 815. $815 is what's considered an affordable rent for someone working full-time minimum wage. And another number, 97,390. That's how many homes renting for less than a thousand dollars a month that we lost between 2016 and 2021. Homes that were once within reach for a minimum wage worker and are now out of reach. As Margaret said, when I speak to colleagues across the country, uh, there's a familiar pattern there. This is happening right across uh, our entire nation. But the difference is how lucky we are, and this is a pretty regular reminder, uh, to have such a strong partner in this government uh, where truly historic investments are being made into new affordable housing supply, as the minister mentioned earlier. Those new investments into new supply are critical, but they're no longer sufficient uh, to solve the housing crisis. Building alone will not uh, solve this crisis. And that's why government's investment into protecting what we already have is so vital. Now, just very briefly, for those skeptical about this approach, I want to share an example that I sort of personally hold up um, as a measure of what can be accomplished through the mission drive of the community housing sector. In 2005, one of our members, Brightside Community Homes Foundation, purchased a rental building in Kitsilano over on the west side of Vancouver. 21 one-bedroom units renting at market rates at the time, get this, $750 a month. That building now in 2023 runs on a rent geared to income model. Average rents are $865 a month, some as low as $450 a month with no tenant in that building paying more than 30% of their income on rent. All of that with no operating subsidy, ongoing operating subsidy from government, and after completing retrofits to the building. Now 2023 is not 2005, but with the right combination of grants and financing, the same outcomes can be achieved today. And that's the power of the nonprofit model. It's also the power of the investment that government has announced here today. So Premier Eby, Minister Callan, uh, MLA Ch Chandra Herbert, uh, thank you for your investment in the sector and for your trust in the sector. With that, I want to turn things over to my colleague, Tom Armstrong, CEO of CHFBC. I'll skip that. <laughs> so is anybody too warm? <clears throat> um, thank you, Jill. Uh, appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be uh, here 
once again with our partners, uh, Jill from the BC Nonprofit Housing Association, Margaret uh, from the Aboriginal Housing Management Association. It also feels like a bit of a, a reunion for the Cardston Court crew. Um, welcome to Mayor Hurley and uh, MLA Katrina Chen who worked so hard uh, to make this uh, possible. We're standing here today still uh, a nonprofit housing co-op with permanently affordable homes uh, for forever. Uh, so thank you to the board and the members of uh, 115 Place Housing Co-op for your hospitality. I want to acknowledge the directors and staff also of the CHFBC team who've joined us here today. This is your day too, uh, so enjoy it. Um, please, really pleased to connect uh, once again after a long time with MLA Spencer Chandra Herbert um, and to acknowledge your long-standing tenacious work uh, as an advocate for renters and congratulations on your new appointment. And of course I want to say to the Premier and to the Minister simply thank you um, for your trust and your confidence, your willingness to lead not just in BC but, but Canada uh, where you will not find a similar precedent uh, as hard as you might uh, look. The idea behind this initiative is breathtakingly simple. If you want to protect a scarce and valuable asset put it somewhere safe. And if that scarce and valuable asset is affordable rental housing, the safest place you can put it is in the community housing sector, where the only reason we get up in the morning is to provide safe, secure, permanently affordable homes to anyone who needs one. The, the powerful idea behind this initiative is that we can't keep losing affordable homes more quickly than we build them. Now, I'm no math genius, I can already hear my staff team saying, no kidding, <laughs> but I know that if you add 10 new homes and lose 20, you're down 10 homes. Um, but that's the hole we've dug for ourselves, and this announcement is the shovel that's going to allow us to start digging uh, back up. Um, I'm so full of optimism uh, for this partnership and for this new fund. I can't wait to be at an event sometime in the near future to tell you that we've already exceeded our minimum unit targets that we're ready for another round of investment, that we've already secured new investments from other levels of government and other fund contributors, but that's for another day. Uh, today is a day to celebrate this new partnership uh, between the government uh, and the community housing sector, to celebrate a government that's willing to lead, not just the province, but the country with the bold, innovative plan to protect rental housing for renters who depend on it for their safety and security. We cannot wait. Uh, to get to work. So it's now my pleasure to introduce someone who knows this issue from quite a different perspective, the president of 115 Place Housing Co-op, Gay Monkman. Thank you, Tom, and um, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming, and thank you to the media for um, taking this to our province, the rest of our province. My name is Gay Monkman and I am the president of 115 Place Housing Co-op and I'd like to thank the Premier and the Minister for this announcement today um, which has a very special meaning for the members of our co-op. The past few years have been very confusing and very stressful for all of our membership. But through all the hard work of all of those involved, we now see the light at the end of the tunnel. And because of this announcement today, I am personally saying, welcome to my home. Welcome to my home. The Premier, who was Minister of Housing at the time, arranged for the financing for Community Land Trust to buy our land and our buildings. And in turn, the Community Land Trust leased it back to the co-op and now we're working in partnership to make a wonderful life together. <laughs> um, I would like to feel that our success here can be used as a model and inspiration for those to follow. Again, thank you, Premier Itty, and uh, thank you, uh, Minister Callan, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, for giving people in a similar situation to ours hope that our homes will be secure and affordable for, for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gay. Uh, so thank you to our speakers. Thank you, Gay, Jill, Margaret, Tom, 
of course, Minister Kellong and Minister Eby, Premier Eby. Um, anyways, uh, we do have some time for questions. I think uh, George over here is going to lead us off on there, and I'll step over here because I imagine you might want to talk to the taller guy. Yep. Yep. We'll be turning to media questions right now. We have a few questions on the line, and then we'll turn to people here joining us. We'll start things off. Uh, just a reminder for all reporters on the line to unmute your phones. Uh, otherwise, we won't be able to hear you. So, starting off with Richard Zussman, Global News. Richard, go ahead. Uh, Premier, I'm trying to understand here what would happen uh, in a potential bidding war. If there are uh, developers or companies from outside of this country, even within the country, that are interested in these properties, could they not then compete against this fund, drive up the prices, and in essence force whoever purchases the building to then charge renters more, doing in essence the reverse of what you hope will happen here? Uh, thanks, Richard. Um, so uh, a couple pieces. Uh, one is in uh, the case of Cardston, for example, uh, this building was held by a pension fund uh, that had a particular interest in trying to find a purchaser that would protect tenants. Uh, and uh, there are many owners like that, that, uh, you know, they've run their, they've had the family building for a long time, they're aging, they want to sell, but they have a personal relationship with the tenants, they want to make sure the tenants are protected. And I think in many cases, we're going to see sellers preferentially selling to the nonprofit sector. In other cases, and particularly sensitive buildings, nonprofits may be, in fact, in a contest for purchasing the building. Uh, but it will be part of the structure of this uh, fund uh, that there are fixed grants per unit, uh, that the business case has to make sense, uh, and that the building needs to be self-sustaining without ongoing funding. Uh, so that will be a limit on the amount that it will be able to pay, but there are many opportunities across the province for this fund to be successful, and I think, in fact, many sellers that will preferentially sell to the fund. Follow up, Richard? Yeah, I, I, you're making a big assumption, though, about what people's interests are. You're just pushing money into a marketplace that could drive up costs. So I'm just trying to understand if you're stopping at all these sort of bidding wars, but but I also have to ask you separately for another story about ICBC. Uh, you put a lot of effort in your previous job into building a new uh, model at ICBC. It, is, it has dramatically lowered rates, but we are still seeing everyday concerns from British Columbians that they are not getting um, from ICBC what they are owed when they are in a serious crash. What sort of accountability is there at ICBC to ensure that people get their lost wages and actually get the type of treatments that they need? They're often being told that, you know, they may have a doctor referral, but ICBC is saying, oh, well, you can only get this type of treatment or this type of uh, support that is closer to your home. So what sort of accountability is there for ICBC to ensure that this enhanced care model is working? Thanks, Richard. To the first point, uh, it's it's not an assumption. It's based on experience in Cardston Court here. Uh, we had a seller that was looking for a purchaser that was going to protect tenants if that was possible. And, uh, and we had to work hard to make it possible, but we did, thanks to the partnership with the City of Burnaby, the hard work of the local MLA, Katrina Chen, and others. Uh, we know that those opportunities are out there. In addition, the Real Estate Investment Trust, they uh, have a business model too. They see the investment upside, and they're working within those constraints as well. So it's not like they're going to pay unlimited amounts for these. But the reality is that there are many opportunities for this fund, and you're going to see it. And I'm very excited about the opportunities to protect renters, make sure that that affordable housing stays. And the, the really exciting part about this is when a nonprofit has that equity in a building, they have the ability to leverage that over time to buy other buildings. Without further assistance, we see this in many jurisdictions around the world, including the United Kingdom. So the nonprofit sector becomes, uh, with an investment like this, uh, creates the possibility to leverage that into future purchases as well. Uh, so that's the really exciting part. In addition, there are many foundations, local governments, and others that could top up money to be able to protect vital housing in their communities. So I, this is actually a very exciting announcement, including around future redevelopment of sites 
where there are aging buildings that need to be replaced, that the tenants are protected, uh, and more rental housing is even brought on. So uh, it's, a, it's a very exciting day, and that's why everyone's in such a good mood here. Uh, beyond that, uh, for ICBC, uh, we knew that when we shifted to the new model uh, of a care-based model, where the focus was on rehabilitation and treatment and support for people to get better, as opposed to compensation for lawyers and years long uh, court processes, uh, that there would be challenges that would come up. So we put in place a number of safeguard levels. We put in place the uh, ombuds, we uh, strengthened the ombudsperson's office within ICBC. People can complain to bring their concerns to that office within ICBC for a second opinion. We put in place the civil resolution tribunal uh, and gave them the resources so that people can go to the Civil Resolution Tribunal to challenge decisions made by ICBC. That accountability is really important. Uh, and certainly, uh, uh, we're going to have uh, uh, cases come up uh, where people uh, are challenging ICBC's decisions, and ICBC's decisions will be overturned. In fact, that's happened on a number of occasions already at the Civil Resolution Tribunal. Uh, so that will continue, uh, but uh, the model will refine as well. You'll see in Minister Farmer's mandate letter, I have asked him specifically uh, to look at the issues related to cyclists and pedestrians, for example. That's something that has come up repeatedly. We'll have to continue to refine. But the good news for British Columbians is we have some of the best benefits in the country, some of the lowest rates in the country. Our public auto insurer is uh, breaking even, and we were able to guarantee freeze on car insurance rates for the next two years. Look at any jurisdiction across the country with private insurers and see what kind of an offer you get there and you'll realize why we made those changes and what benefits come to British Columbians through a, pu a public auto insurer. Thank you. Next we have Binder Sajjan, CTV News. Binder, your line's open. Hi, uh, Premier. Um, I understand you're there uh, at Cardston Court, and I'm looking at a release from BC Housing that says that the uh, BC Housing provided about $132 million for that project. Your fund here is about $500 million, um, which would mean about four projects of that size. But I'm wondering if you have an estimate of how many projects you think uh, maybe by the end of the year we could see where nonprofits are buying up buildings like this. Uh, we believe that this fund is going to create the possibility for financing of thousands of units. The exact numbers are going to vary. Uh, the prices for real estate obviously vary quite dramatically across the province. Uh, Metro Vancouver has some of the most expensive housing uh, in the world. Uh, but when you get outside of Metro Vancouver uh, and you're talking about rental buildings in Smithers or a rental building in uh, uh, out in the Kootenays somewhere, uh, the prices come down quite dramatically and, uh, and it really stretches the budget. In addition, uh, nonprofit organizations have the capacity to identify other uh, funders, other supports that are available to stretch those dollars. So it's very hard to put a firm number on how many units uh, we're going to be able to realize uh, through this fund and our partnerships, uh, but we believe it's in the thousands of units. Follow up, Binder? Yes, please. Um, and I understand, that, you know, it sounds like it's a process that would take um, a while to go through, and I'm sure you here and we all hear of people who are looking for housing right now. Um, and so what do you say to somebody who may be looking for housing right now, is looking around, not finding anything that is affordable, saying, I'm sure they might say that this is nice for the future, but it doesn't meet their immediate needs. Yeah, so uh, what this fund is really aimed at is... Um, uh, you heard Tom Armstrong talk about when you're in a hole with a shovel, you know, you need to stop digging. You need to uh, to, to deal with uh, the fact that you keep going deeper, and that's what this fund is about. So uh, when you're talking about Cardston Court here, the building that we're at, this is uh, 425 units, uh, uh, hundreds of people that are not out on the market looking for rental housing somewhere else right now uh, because we bought and protected these renters' homes. Uh, and uh, so this will help take the pressure off the rental market, uh, but we know that's not enough. Uh, we set a record this year for purpose-built rental housing, so we know that our policies and programs are working, uh, but we know that we need to do so much more. So for renters that are, uh, and home buyers that are looking for a place they can afford, I want them to know that our government is very focused on this. This is one of our key priority areas to address the housing crisis. And we know that our work uh, must continue in this area and you will continue to see more from us around housing affordability. Next, we have Rob Shaw, Czech News. Rob, go ahead. 
Hi, Premier. Uh, different topic. Could you give us your reaction to Canfor's decision to close, uh, permanently close the pulp line in Prince George, uh, which has cost 300 people their jobs, and what government's uh, doing to help there? Uh, thanks, Rob. This is obviously uh, devastating news for uh, those 300 individuals who have lost their jobs for their families. Uh, these are uh, people with mortgages, with car payments, uh, an incredibly stressful time for them and for the whole community in Prince George. Um, uh, we see that, I understand that, and so government is deploying a, a crisis response team to Prince George. Uh, we have resources available for situations like this to support those individuals and those families that are going to be in crisis as a result of this decision. Our team that uh, will be there will uh, support those individuals in going through uh, to be able to access those benefits that we have, whether it's around training, transitioning to retirement, uh, or other supports. I'm gonna be up in Prince George personally uh, next week. I look forward to meeting with uh, people affected. Uh, I'll certainly be meeting with the mayor and others. Uh, it's, uh, it's terrible news, and uh, government will be there to support those families. Follow up? Uh, sure, thanks. There's a pitch from the BC Pulp and Paper Coalition made to your government last July to help them transition to a future, uh, focus on things like the packaging for you know online products, stuff that would be value added uh, and create jobs. I'm wondering if you could tell us, have you seen this pitch? Is your government interested in helping save some of these mills with transformation before they close? And what's the status of it? Uh, yes, I'm, uh, I'm aware of the proposal and uh, government's been working closely with industry on innovation, on uh, transition so that they can do more value added products, keep jobs in the province. Uh, one of the uh, uh, changes, making sure that uh, forestry companies take more uh, material out of the bush so that it's available for pulp and, uh, and paper as opposed to just leaving it uh, when they're done with the site. Uh, but uh, in terms of the specific proposals around support for innovation, we'll have more to say in the coming days on that. Uh, and, uh, and I'm very uh, interested in this opportunity of making a sustainable forest industry, recognizing that with pine beetle kill, uh, and the failure of previous governments to replant, uh, we do have a shortage of, uh, of uh, uh, timber uh, and feedstock, so we need to get more jobs out of the trees that we do have, and that will only come through innovation and, uh, and using materials wisely. Next, we have Lisa Yusta, City News. Lisa, go ahead. Hi there, Premier. Um, I'm wondering what safeguards there are to ensure that the organizations getting this money to purchase buildings will keep them at a solid standard and at rents that are affordable, and how do you ensure that they're going to be purchased in communities where units are most needed? You mentioned Smithers. That isn't what people think of really when they think of rental challenges. Yeah, it's, uh, it's disturbing to many British Columbians how the housing crisis has uh, uh, spread into much smaller communities. During the pandemic, we saw many people choose to relocate to smaller communities that hadn't seen rental housing or housing construction even at a significant level for many years. Uh, plus, with our growing population, we're seeing people choose to locate in centres other than the lower mainland. We're seeing growing populations across the province. So that rental housing strain, that affordable housing strain, is showing up in different places uh, in the province uh, and so uh, one of the things that uh, that we're counting on and uh, and we'll be entering into an agreement with uh, uh, these nonprofit housing uh, sector leaders that have set up uh, the society that will administer this fund we'll be entering into a formal agreement with them that will have safeguards to ensure that uh, that uh, government's expectations are met around these housing purchases around accountability uh, and uh, and I have real confidence uh, in these affordable housing uh, leaders. They know where the issues are. They know where the opportunities are. Uh, and, uh, and they will be able to act quickly to protect renters and to protect that housing. Lisa, follow up? Yes, it's for a specific story we're working on, similar kind of issue. A renter in the Trout Lake area living in the same three bedroom for nine years, has had some different roommates throughout, Recently a flood, one roommate left, and the landlord took this opportunity to enforce a rule allowing that they end the rental agreement. He's offered to stay on at a higher rent. Landlord says they can't do that. Residential tenancy branch said they can't do that. And so this person who's lived there for nine years is now going to be ousted. 
it seems like another loophole that's there protect, protecting landlords, not renters. Is there anything you can do or that the province can do? Uh, we continually monitor uh, what's happening in the rental housing market and in particular uh, issues coming out of the residential tenancy branch, issues around eviction, for example, or rent hikes. Uh, and we have adjusted our laws accordingly to respond when we saw so-called rent evictions where people put up a coat of paint and, uh, and say they need a vacant unit to do that and kick out a long-standing tenant, uh, closing those loopholes, the fixed-term lease loophole. Uh, it seems like there's no end of creativity on the part of some people that are seeking to exploit uh, uh, renters. It's disappointing. There's so many responsible landlords. The, a few bad examples uh, can really uh, set a tone. Uh, but we will address issues as they come up. Uh, roommates is a particularly challenging issue, but Mr. Kalon uh, is currently uh, with the special liaison for renters uh, looking at our residential tenancy branch uh, rules, making sure that they're relevant for what's happening in the market right now. Next, we have Dirk Meisner, Canadian Press. Dirk, your line's open. <coughs> hi, hi, Premier. Uh, hey, is Dirk. there any, um, hi. Well, what a is there any protection can say a, a non-profit uh, buying up buying a property through with the government funds and then turning around and selling it um so we're going to enter into an agreement with the uh, uh non-profit housing operators that are going to form the board of this society that's going to administer this fund uh, to make sure that our expectations are met and one of those key expectations is that tenants are protected uh, and that's the whole purpose of the fund. Uh, so there are going to be uh, situations, Dirk, where there's an older rental building that needs significant capital repairs, and the nonprofit with the renters may come to the conclusion that it needs to be redeveloped, that there can be uh, new rental units built, uh, and there can be a larger building built on the site. Uh, and so there may be situations like that. But this will not be a uh, fund that is used um, for uh, speculation on by nonprofit housing organizations, but of course that would be completely contrary to the mission of the very organizations that are going to be benefiting from this fund. Follow up, Dirk. Cool. Th thank you. I'm, I'm also wondering, um, what, will this um, move at all help uh, renters who are who are not uh, in uh, nonprofit housing, like lowering rent? Yes, yeah, so this, this fund is specifically aimed at those renters that are living in a privately owned, uh, purpose-built rental building. Uh, and uh, it is aimed to help them because when the nonprofit purchases that building, uh, the nonprofit will be working with those renters to ensure that rents stay affordable, that their tenancies, uh, that their ability to have an affordable home is protected, uh, and that the building, uh, that the units remain affordable going forward. Uh, and so this fund is actually intended for uh, those people that are currently living in precarious, privately owned rental buildings that might otherwise be sold to an international or national investment fund. We've got one more question on the phone line and then we're going to turn to in person. Katie DeRosa, over to you. Hi, Premier. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Is there a plan for legislation that was also part of your uh, housing uh, platform to create a law allowing uh, nonprofits to have first right of refusal so it prevents a bidding war with private investors? Uh, yes, I'm very interested in, uh, in uh, our government uh, uh, pursuing a right of first refusal around uh, the purchase of private rental buildings by these large real estate investment trusts. Uh, the uh, government of Quebec has implemented a right of first refusal like this. Uh, that kind of policy reform gives us a handle on what's happening in the market, but also gives us the opportunity uh, to, uh, to purchase uh, with funds that we now have available. Uh, this fund is the first step. The policy work on any change like that is ongoing, uh, and it will not be in the upcoming uh, legislative session, uh, but it is something we are actively looking at. Okay, you have a follow-up? And the, the release says that the province will also support nonprofits to get funding from, you know, private, uh, you know, private financing. So with the $500 million, considering that, you know, is a limited amount of money, is it that the, the, the one-time capital grant isn't necessarily going to provide all of the funds to purchase a property, but part of the funds and then the rest will be uh, done through private financing? 
So uh, the, the Cardston Court example that we're at here today might be a good example. Uh, resources came from the provincial government, from uh, the uh, uh, city of Burnaby uh, together um, to, uh, to complete this purchase. Um, but there are, uh, in addition, private foundations and others that may be providing funding. It may be that a nonprofit uh, accesses financing to, uh, to make up uh, the difference. It could be that the purchase is part of a larger plan uh, to uh, use financing to purchase more than one site. I wonder, uh, Tom or Jill, if either of you uh, want to talk about the opportunities with foundations or financing. Yes, thanks, Premier. We, <clears throat> we do believe and, and have been in, in uh, conversation with uh, foundations and other social impact investors who are looking for a place to earn a, a modest return on an investment, uh, but also achieve a social return. Uh, so we think there are many, many opportunities to expand the resources that are going to be available through this fund. And uh, that's why we're excited about today. We can't wait to get started uh, sourcing those additional funds. Thanks very much. We're going to in person here to your right, Premier Benoit from CBC Radio Canada. Uh, bonjour, Premier. Um, my question is about the financing. Will the 500 million come from the next February budget? And also, after what happens to the fund in the next years, will it be refinanced? Uh, so, uh, the $500 million for this fund is coming from this fiscal year. Uh, the money will be deployed uh, before uh, the end of the fiscal year, which means for uh, the purchase of rental buildings uh, that that work uh, could start uh, as soon as uh, within the next uh, uh, 60 to 90 days, uh, which is really exciting. This is going to be happening uh, very quickly, uh, but uh, obviously responsibly, and, uh, but with a sense of urgency about the housing crisis uh, that we're facing. Um, so uh, I'm really excited that that, that work is going to start right away. Follow up, uh, my, my question was about about the ne also about the next year. So oh, I see. Yes, happen, and yeah. and, and uh, going forward, we'll review how the program has uh, done, uh, the purchases that have been made, uh, the leveraging of government's money with additional uh, private financing and other partners, uh, and make decisions about future allocations uh, at that point. Yes. Uh, British Columbians have lived through uh, an astonishing number of weather-related uh, crises, uh, whether floods or forest fires, the heat dome, uh, many of them linked to uh, human-caused climate change. Uh, we're seeing in California uh, massive atmospheric rivers similar to what we saw uh, in the Fraser Valley. Uh, it is concern about these shifting weather patterns caused by climate change uh, that led me to establish a new ministry for government uh, to ensure that we are prepared for this. That uh, for the areas where we can predict uh, there will be impacts on infrastructure, whether it's highways, uh, whether it's homes, um, and uh, that we're prepared for that. That the dikes are in place, uh, that the emergency responses are in place uh, related to climate change, that we're preparing for uh, what's coming. Uh, we have done significant work uh, and uh, on lessons learned out of previous forest fire seasons, out of the atmospheric rivers, the heat dome, uh, implementing recommendations, implementing lessons learned. Uh, we will continue to be there for British Columbians affected by weather-related uh, crises and we have a dedicated minister and ministry to that very issue now. Thanks very much. That's all we have time for today's Great. Thanks, Thanks very much. Okay. So Overall, it looks like David Eby is promising uh, almost uh, a half a billion dollars in support for people who um, need to find rental space um, for their families. Just for comparative sakes, um, British Columbia for renters, um, the cost of renting on average is about... Um, $1,660 for, uh, for a rental that would probably be for a one bedroom and 
that puts them number nine uh, on the out of the top 15 most expensive places to actually rent. Uh, well, by way of comparison, we should also, if, because the list is here, that we should say that for homeowners, um, British Columbia is actually ranked at number eight, in which case the average mortgage uh, payment probably for a, again, uh, for a two-bedroom um, home would be $2,084. It is an expensive housing our families and with the cost of, of everything else going up, food, fuel, and everything else, um, it it can be quite expensive. And then we've also reported on uh, daycare availability is becoming scarce because, well, they're having one, they're having trouble finding workers. Um, some of that is due to due due to other issues that we've talked about, uh, including probably including uh, rent, and in including um, is the ten dollar day daycare programs really working? That is being set up by the federal government. Are they following through on their promises there? So, without the daycare being there, that means that um, families will be relying on maybe one person to be able to go out or work or if, um, if both parents are working the, does that mean that one can only work part time and how does it all work out so there's a lot of issues out there uh, around affordable housing and being able to afford to have a lifestyle. So, thank you for listening to us today here at Depictions Media. Thank you for listening to Policy and Rights. I've been your host, Michael Cloggs, and we do ask you that that you find that subscribe button wherever you're listening to us. We're on many different uh, podcast databases and systems, including Apple. Uh, Google and Spotify, as well as Spreaker, where we actually upload our our recordings to. So, find that subscribe button and get continued updates from us. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.